please welcome Mr. Gary Schwartz. I'm going to start with Hugo here, Gurmsbach, um, who the year before I, I was born had a number of patents on, on, on gloss, Google Gloss type uh, appliances. Um, and, and, and that whole idea of, you know, how do we take content and how do we make it part of our, our autonomy? How, uh, how do we make it part of uh, our, our, the way we, we view the world? How do we make it part of our, our wearable landscape? And so today I'm going to talk about really the relationships behind all these physical objects, right? I'm going to talk about the circle of trust you know, from the Fockers, right? And, and how big data is important, but ultimately big data can't be a science project. Big data is about the relationship, the Ben still a hug, right? It's about how we can, can, can create a relationship which ultimately gets, gets to our guests, get to our fans, get to our shoppers, because ultimately that's what we want to go, right? We want to create relationships with people and the technology, the digital residue, the, the, the connected devices are great, but they're a means to an end. And today I, I want to talk to you about that end, that relationship building exercise, which is essential for this next, next evolution as we pivot into the IoT. So I was born somewhere around there, which is uh, Zambia. I was born in a little mining town called Kitwe. Uh, the year before Hugo came up with his glasses. And, uh, you know, he used to play in our backyard, probably like you played in your backyard. Um, and in our house, we had a library. And, you know, as libraries, you know, were stocked in those days, we had a little vinyl in the corner, had a few dog-eared you know, novels. And, and and one of the things we had that my, my parents collected was punch magazines. I don't know if you ever flipped through a punch magazine, but essentially uh, it was the, the, um, the, the sort of satirical document of the time, right? So the John Oliver of the turn of the century. And, and, and it's interesting because I inherited a few of these documents. This is a compilation from uh, 1906. And at the back of this, there's a view towards 1907. Right? And, and what they did is they asked some of the illustrators to sort of predict the future. You know, what was going to happen in 1907? Right? And, and, and you know, some of the, the little vignettes they put in were very tongue in cheek, right? So, you know, here it's uh, fireworks for daytime consumption. And they, they had, you know, uh, doctors doing, uh, you know, patient visits on, on hot air balloons, right? But what they had on, on page 450 odd in the publication was, was this one, 451, which was a forecast for the coming year and they had this woman and this man in Hyde Park. And the title for this <laughs> prediction, again, probably very much tongue in cheek, was Development of Wireless Telegraph. Right? And seen in Hyde Park, these two figures are not communicating with one another. The lady is receiving amatory messages and the gentleman some racing results. Well, how prescient, prescient is that? How amazing that 100 years ago we were talking about the fact that we weren't communicating with one another anymore. We're sitting in a park, you know, we have this box on our lap and it's spitting out a ticket tape of text. Right? Nothing's changed. And this view of the future in 1907, if you actually take it exactly 100 years from this date. We're here. To the month. When an individual stands up on the stage and talks about a device that will revolutionize the way that we communicate. A device that will let us absolutely do amateur messages, right? We'll fall in love with our devices. This is the her device, right? 
and a device that will give you data to allow you to do things, whether that be racing results, which is pretty much core to data on a phone right now, through to other data touch points which change the way we do business, the change the way we socialize, right? And what I want to talk to you about in the first part of my chat is the first 100 years of being human. I don't want to talk to you about technology. I want to talk to you about the consumption of technology and how it's changed our lives fundamentally and how if we get the way it changes people's lives going forward, we'll be able to run really, really productive businesses into 2015, 2016. So let me start here. Here's an insight that I use in our company a lot when we talk to, to customers. Because people, when they meet with vendors, people, when they meet with technologists, the first thing they want to know is, tell me about your technology. Tell me how it's going to change the way we do business. But ultimately, all the companies out there that really get it, they don't focus on technology per se. They focus on the customer experience. And the companies that get it right reap the benefits. I mean, if you look at the S&P 500, the companies that get it right, the guys that are excelling and not the laggards, are the guys that get that human insight. The guys that can communicate to their customers and drive affinity and stickiness with that customer and that fan on an onward going basis. So with that in mind, let's take a look at, at what's happening in the streets today. So, Yesterday, walking up Spadina, saw a bus, Remax ad, no app required. What is that telling us? It's telling us that customers are trying to cut through all the digital red tape, cut through all those layers which really inhibit them connecting with their customer, delighting their customer. If I can eliminate the app player, great. I'm closer to my customer, I'm closer to conversion, I have less abandonment of intent. It's all good, right? If you look at a street in New York and an ad from Booking Now, which is obviously the operative word for any business, your perfect room in two taps, right? Again, trying to count clicks to commerce, trying to count clicks to conversion, because every click is a precipitous drop off. Right? Essential for you to know because every click you design in your application, in your service, every door you ask them to go through, whether it be physical or virtual, is going to drive drop off. So, so somebody like, you know, an Amazon, they patented the whole concept of one click checkout. Why? Why was that a fundamental pillar? of their business and continues to be a fundamental, not just marketing pillar, but a fundamental business pillar of the way that they go about engaging with somebody and checking them out, right? And so one click checkout is, is essential for you to go out and in impulse way buy your bounce, right? But if I can't take the clicks out of the conversation, and if I can just get this person off the phone, even this, uh, I'm always in the now, you see. So if, if, I, if I can actually say, you know what? You need bounce? You need tie? That's great. So you're in the middle of, of, of washing things and you don't have enough. So why don't you go and find your phone? Why don't you open the phone, put in the password, get through, find the app, open the app then find the product, then get to the checkout. Yes, maybe my, my credentials are saved, still have to click, still have to accept, and that's my one-click checkout. Ultimately, if I could have an impulse checkout where I can, in the middle of my, my routine, uh, click a button that stores all my credentials and literally will go through to Amazon Prime, through my Wi-Fi, alert them that there's somebody in desperate need of Tide, and the Amazon Prime, you know, lieutenants are out there, and they're coming to my house within 24 hours. That's a beautiful thing. And so, the whole idea of understanding the, the human behind the machine, 
is understanding how to optimize our business for that person, right? So I kind of want to get away from this whole digital revolution because digital is just a means to an end. Ultimately, it's not about digitizing your life, it's about immediatizing your life. It's about doing things in an optimal way. Now, absolutely, digital could be a component of that, but that's not a fundamental building block. A fundamental building block is understanding your consumer. So, let's, let's, let's move on. Uh, uh, if you don't get that, if you don't get that insight, well then suddenly you're deer in the headlights, right? You are looking at technology, you're looking at HAL 9000 and going, oh my gosh, technology is taking over and woe is me, right? And I really need to switch this off. So ultimately, you need to, you know, you need to have a strategy which, which allows you to, to embrace that immediacy, to embrace those challenges in your business. Otherwise, you're going to be here and ultimately, you're going to be here in an industry that has been disintermediated, the book industry. Here's a, here's a, a stroll down Bloor Street, guys. Okay, Book City, out of business. What does the book, the, the book City manager put in the window? Thanks for the tip. I'll get it on Amazon. Woe is me, you know? They showroomed me. I, I, I don't have a business. Well, ultimately, that is a sorry state of affairs for the book industry, but ultimately, it's because they're deer in the headlights and they didn't adapt. There are ways that you can grapple with the whole idea of clicks to commerce and embrace that. Embrace that to drive a new relationship with your customer, a new relationship with your fan. So with that in mind, I, I want to talk to you about new industries that are just jumping up all over the place, right? So when I came down here today, I, 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 I ordered a book, right? And historically, when I would go out into the street and I would flag a cab, you know, you'd think that would be a very, very human thing, right? I'm on the street. I have intent to get somewhere. I have a cab that is saying, I'm in the business of getting you somewhere. You put up your hand, it stops, it says, hey pal. You go in, you say, nice day, where are you going? It should be a beautiful human experience. What has happened because of digital becoming warmer, becoming more of a trusted partner in the way that we navigate, Cars like this, the cab companies, are looking dusty and old world. And it's the digital guys that are looking warm and friendly. And if I can hail a cab to my house and my, my daughter runs out and she's following them down the street and she sees it sliding up and she goes, hey, and she knows their name and they know my name. That's a warm and beautiful experience. It's the same experience you have with Instacart. Instacart is taking back what the grocery stores threw out. Grocery stores also, tight margin business, right? What happened in the old world? You had the grocery store, you had a relationship with the grocery store owner. Grocery store owner, you know, basically hired little Johnny. Little Johnny used to get the groceries together and run it to Mr. Jones, right? But what happened is we cut that out. We cut that out because the margin wasn't there. But now what happens is a company like Instacart comes back, introduces the love back into that relationship. Now you don't have a relationship with the grocery store. You have a relationship with this dude. And he's a digital dude. That's an amazing thing. And, and so you get that everywhere. Welcome home. I'm going to, to, to an online portal that's offering me home. It's offering me warmth. It's offering me trust. Digital trust, digital bear hugs. The Ben Stiller digital bear hug is what we're trying to achieve here. And, and, and so when we look at the new businesses out there and, and we get challenged in, in the technology of clicking, and, and you look at the new businesses and they, they, they're all talking about IoT and the internet of things and how we can actually um, take you know, our cabs and our grocery stores and our uh, apartments and turn them in to a digital relationship. There are companies out there like this one out of South Africa that's trying to become a backbone for the IoT. 
and they've come up with a, a platform called Ubuntu. And, and, and Ubuntu in Zulu means the quality of humanness. Right? A platform for a new generation of digital, a new generation of connecting things, and it's called humanness. And, and that really is the core of what I'm going to talk to you about today. So where this all starts is in something that people like to continue to remind you existed a way back when, which is a, a truck somewhere trying to communicate some data to a server somewhere. And they say, hey, the IoT, the Internet of Things, it started here. Right? And, and, and so, you know, when, when people talk about M to M, they say, well, really, IoT is just a rebranding of machine to machine. But ultimately, asset tracking and smart grids and building automation is imbuing things with some smarts. And there's an evolution of that, of course. But when the Wall Street Journal turns around and says the Internet of Things is reaching out a trucking business, like, as if this is something new, we need to take a step back and understand that this is just an evolution from a truck, you know, going back 20 years, who would store data and maybe off, off, upload it once a day or once a week to real-time data collection and real-time data management, which is interesting. And there's huge value in that from a B2B perspective. But what I want to talk to you about today, which is so much more relevant to this crowd, is the fact that that view of the IoT is very much machine in the middle, right? It's that stormtrooper in the middle, right? And the stormtrooper, you could shoot with impunity. Remember Star, you know, it's, it's Star Wars, you know, bam, 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 they should die, like, no blood. It was fun, right? That's why, that's why you know, Lucas got the PG rating, man. Because you could shoot those guys, they died. You never knew they were human. There was supposed to be flesh and blood behind them because the whole idea of a stormtrooper is it's, it's, it's armor cladding on top of all those you know, um, different sort of species that would come in and get you know, uh, seconded to the army. Um, but ultimately, there was no blood, so it was human in the middle. Where we're going here is to very much a different view of the world. And so the truck B, you know, B2B, M2M sort of paradigm is valuable, but really when we're talking about the IoT, we're talking about how does the human fit into that equation? How does the H fit between the M and the M, right? And that insight, that human insight is what's gonna drive M2M -M into ubiquitous internet with a very different spin. And we're going to talk about that today. So let's go back to Comdex, right? This is Comdex. I think it's around 2001, right? Bill's there. So excited, right? Why is Bill excited? Because he just came out with a tablet PC, right? And he says, dude, not only is it super cool, not only is the tablet PC super cool, Bill said that we're so fired up about this tablet PC that all our engineers are ta taking the tablet PC home with them, but they want to play with it. Well, that was the problem. This was a technologist coming out with a technology solution with no insight into the consumer. Bunch of engineers with styluses, right? And a few years later, this guy comes on stage, offers us something which delights us. What, what does Steve Jobs say about styluses? Anybody? We're born with five of them, right? He was very much focused on the way that we interact with font, the way that we interact with, you know, the screen. He was not a technologist. And, and, and so what he did is he allowed us to pinch and zoom into data. He allowed us to interact with things in a very human way and that allowed us to embrace the technology and jump into maps and explore things on the fly, even though it was on a rinky-dink little screen, right? And that inspired people to fall in love with the technology 
and you know line up for blocks for this because it wasn't about oh my gosh isn't this the coolest technology it it became very much an extension of the way that they interacted with the world right I had a, a panel earlier today we we're talking about tiny screens and I quoted from from Freud who who talks about you know the, the fact that even pre-technology that that we want to make ourselves supermen by giving ourselves things that 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 can extend our capabilities right so so he may be talking about a sword or a wig or something like that but ultimately when we continually carry a phone around with us it becomes a prosthetic and Freud talked about the fact that we like to be prosthetic gods right this became an extension of the way that we deal dealt with the world right so um, and, and really as I said really the evolution of the phone was from this to this what really changed ultimately was about communication form factor was great I could put it in my pocket made it more convenient to chat with people but ultimately it was about a relationship that I had and this facilitated it and the only technology that we're really talking about in this is voice and text what happened with this device which is so profound is that this device because of all these sensors and, and, and all this stuff that was put into the device turned it from a machine into the first IOT thing right this was the first IOT thing this was the first internet of things thing and and as you know Rolf Simon who may or not may be here tonight but he's he's in the crowd talks about the intelligence of things and ultimately that's what we're talking about how can things be ambient and imbue humanity how can we go up to them and not be deer in the headlights not say oh no hell 900 don't shut down my aircraft and leave me out in space how do we say you know you're part of me you're a prosthetic extension right so uh, and so it's very much the human embracing the M. And I'm going to talk about this digital duct tape a lot. Right? And so for the next little session, I, I want to talk to you about pelicans and duct tape. I want to talk to you about how we can connect all these things, whether they be physical things, whether they be digital things, whether they be interpersonal things, and, and make our businesses more successful whether that be shopping, you know, having a venue and engaging with fans, you know, whether that be a city in interacting with their, their citizens more intelligently, a bank interacting with, with their customers more intelligently. That is really where we're at. We're at this, this, this incredible point where we're moving out of the confines of a browser and an app store into the real world. How exciting is that? How exciting? Because our, our, the last 10 years, the last 15 years, we haven't done anything except talk about digital. And digital is one little widget in our day. If suddenly digital is, is permeate, permeates everything we do, then we have so many more businesses, so many more opportunities as, as we grow. So part two, we're gonna be talking about pelicans and we're gonna be talking about the duct tape that connects all of the things around us. So here's, here's, here's my pelican, and, and, and just go watch this, it's, it's a beautiful thing, is the relationship that we have with this object here is, is, is profoundly different to the relationship we have to, uh, 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 with this object if, it, if, if we were just on the side looking at this pelican. The, the way that we interact with things, the way that we, we, we see things, the way we talk to things, it changes our relationship profoundly. And as we move forward, we need to think of these things, toasters and, you know, uh, cars and, you know, watches. And, and we need to connect those things with intelligent actions, right? So we have a Pelican, we connected it to a GoPro. It took on a different relationship, right? So, you can take that same idea and you can shove a GoPro into your dishwasher. 
And I know you guys are staying up late at night saying, gee, I wish I knew what happened in that dishwasher when I turned it on when I got to sleep. Oh my God, you shove a GoPro in there. And isn't that exciting? But this thing married with digital duct tape to an action does profoundly change our world, right? So, but if I was able to mitigate a knob turn and talk to my washing machine in a human way, the same way that I talk to my daughter when I say, it's 12.30, where are you? If I could say to my dishwasher, 12.30, could you just change, change the cycle? That allows me to have a different relationship with that inanimate object. It allows for huge business opportunities. So when we have a basketball and we put a sensor into a basketball, then that basketball who always wanted to tell you, Gary, your game sucks, you know, now can tell you. Their, their data now has the ability to take the inanimate object and turn it into something that can communicate to you and also change your behavior. Because now you can say, spin a little bit to the left and you'll get it in the net, right? It changes the relationship between you and your coach and the ball. And the ball becomes part of that inner circle. Is this profoundly changing the way we communicate if it's not necessarily making us better humans, right? Why did we give up on Google Glass? We gave up on Google Glass because ultimately, if we need a data snack, the social way to do that is to say, sorry, I got a call coming in. I apologize. But to serendipitously do it, or nefariously do it, is not really a social norm. And that's why, you know, Google Glass had a hard time. I, I watch is cute. It'll have a hard time too. Ultimately, what we have to battle through here is not creating, you know, cool little widgets. It's understanding how to create a social narrative on top of all these new screens, all these new um, interactions. And ultimately, um, screens may not be involved at all because the optimal way to engage with something is to intuit. And, and if you can intuit a behavior, you don't need the screen because you do not need to have a dashboard to interact, right? Uh, I have a buddy who works for a company in, in New York called uh, Two Bulls, Bulls, and uh, they, they do stuff for Sesame Street and whatnot, and they, they're really good at narrative. Right? They, they came up with a, with a game where you can walk through Central Park and uh, you can hold up your, your phone and you see trolls and pixies. It's a game. It's really cool. Really nice. Suddenly, they're working for Qualcomm. They're working for Qualcomm, putting together a narrative for the all seen Alliance. That's where the opportunity is. is. Is going from the widgets and going from all the coolness to understanding how to connect these things in a way which isn't like programming the damn VCR, right? And so if you don't get that, where do you land up? You land up from the gift box to the sock drawer, right? How many wonderful gifts did you get on Father's Day or Mother's Day that ended up ultimately in a drawer somewhere? Because, oh, the Fitbit was great, and I used it for a few months, and then it was like, okay. Ultimately, if these things can't fit into our lifestyle, if they don't become seamless, and, and, and you don't, and this is what you know, uh, the Two Cows founder, Noah, told me uh, on the phone, if you can't find the ghost inside the machine, that, that quiet relationship with the technology, which allows you to communicate to it, then you're missing the mark, right? And you end up under the socks, forgotten. Right? And wearables are in that danger zone. If you look at the drop-off uh, in the Gartner hype, hype chart, the sales and, and, and abandonment of, of those items it follows the Gartner hype chart, hype, hype chart exactly the same trajectory. You go up, you buy a lot, and then ultimately the market diffuses because there's just so many cool things that you can buy one Christmas that you don't need the next. So, what, what we're seeing now is the same hype that, that happened around the App Store, right? Everybody had to have an app. You know, Apple, great marketing, easy SDK, got to build an app because I've got to be on the App Store. God forbid somebody 
searches on the App Store and I'm not there, right? And so what's happening now is we becoming, we, we're building a physical app store. If you go into an Apple store right now, or you go into an electronic store, you will see a shelf of physical products that are essentially physical apps for the real world. This is your IoT shelf, right? You know, whether it be, you know, a Nest thermostat through, you know, to a garage opener, tons of things that well, are you know, supposed to be able to your life, right? And, and the physical app store is, is here as well, right? So I've, I have a, a bike, it's, it's an IoT bike, it has software embedded into the bike which allows me to intuit not only my, you know, my Fitbit style sort of tracking, but also the, the road and, and, and cars around me and there's haptic feedback in the handlebars to say, hey, there's a car to the left and oops, you know what, somebody came here last week in, in, in this network of bikes. Sally was riding down the street and she, she, she'd like nearly kill herself in a pothole. I can tell Sam the next day that, dude, somebody on our network nearly broke their neck there, moved to the left. Right? And if I can create that sort of network of value, if I can take that data and I can communicate to the person that's riding the bike about the pothole without getting them to kill themselves by looking at a screen to avoid the pothole, then I've done my job, right? And that's a challenge, that's a UI UX challenge. It's a very human challenge as we move forward. So you have, as you know, technology out there that is, is supposed to be changing our life. Now you have the Nest network, right? Bought by Google. Nest was a device made by a bunch of guys from Apple, parachuted from Apple. Beautifully designed device because they're Apple guys and Google bought them. And on top of that has created, is starting to create a network for the smart home. And so the, the Nest uh, thermostats is in the center of that, talks to your Wi-Fi, and now they go out and they buy a drop cam as a company, adds it to their portfolio of essential things that they are you know, uh, offering somebody who's on the Nest, Nest Network to manage their home, and then at the last CES, starts pulling in all these partners, lock companies, and, 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 and smart dishwashers, and, and Qualcomm, and their lighting initiatives, and Philips, all to be part of their, their network all through the charging stations for the car so that your house essentially becomes a dashboard. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. Nest is a private network, but it's managed in the public cloud. So it goes through your Wi-Fi into the public internet. Now, you have another way of looking at this, which is the All Seen Alliance, which Qualcomm is at the center of. <coughs> And they look at the world a little differently. So they will take a chip, and the chip has, it has all the intelligence embedded in the chip, plus Wi-Fi to network, mesh network uh, their, their, um, their solution into lights. And, and so they will, you know, in a world, I don't know if you know, but Qualcomm has a, is a pretty much patents locked up on phones. For, uh, for past generation phones. They're getting into a bit of a quandary because they don't have patents moving forward into next generation phones. So they literally take nine pennies of every 10 pennies that are spent on a phone through their, their patents. It's an amazing, amazing uh, uh, legacy operation. What other technology can they get into which is ubiquitous as phones? You all have a phone. So if you counted, probably, roughly, there's as many phones in this room as there are lights, right? So if they can start getting a few pennies off every light, that's a good business too. Smart guys, Qualcomm. So, so ultimately, the difference is that all CN Alliance is a private network managed through a parallel network. So it's, it's private, it's private and it, and it manages itself. Now, these are crucial things because ultimately, somebody's gonna hack your home and somebody's gonna hack your car, and somebody's gonna hack into a community because it's on the internet, and things happen. But ultimately, these are the things that we're thrashing out. The, uh, the IoT right now is, 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 is really the dust hasn't settled. You have Qualcomm, you have uh, obviously the Googles of the world, you have uh, the Intels of the world, you have every Leviathan out there trying to get a footing, get a network, get a relationship. 
Everybody has a different strategy and one of these networks is going to become the predominant winner. Uh, so let, you know, if we go back to our equation, a thing plus an action plus a network is really critical to how we build this IoT moving forward. It's not about you being connected to a toaster. It's about you being connected to a toaster, which is connected to the fridge to say you're out of bread, go and buy it, click here, order there, things happen. That network of, of, of value is the amplification of what we're talking about with the IoT. It's not about a cute little baby monitor which allows you to watch your baby from a distance. It's about the totality of creating a smart environment around your family, around your office, around your concert. So the, the thing to look for here is, does everybody know what a Nexus device is? Anybody has a Nexus? Not, not, nice, nice device. And, and who makes the Nexus? LG. LG makes the Nexus, who makes the Nexus? Google makes the Nexus, right? Well, actually, Samsung's made the first Nexus. You're absolutely right that LG made the second Nexus. And the third one is now made by Motorola. Who cares? Who cares? These guys are commodity brokers. They just make the thing. The value is in the software. The value is in the fact that I want a Nexus device. Do I really care? that it was made first generation by Samsung, second generation made by LG, third generation by Motorola. No, because we get the operating system first. <coughs> we get KitKat first before you Yahoo's the went and bought the more expensive device, right? And, and ultimately, these guys can be disintermediated. Now, if you look at other industries, let's look at the car industry. If you go talk to car industry guys, like I do, and you speak to them about their business, they are very much in this business, right? Which is, you know, managing a keretsu, getting tires from point A to point B, you know, the, the, oh my gosh, the paint shipment hasn't come in. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. The last thing they want to think about is what software is that cute little thing that manages the songs on the dashboard and, and sort of ambient stuff in the car. Who cares, right? So you have Apple that comes in, has CarPlay platform, right? And then you have you know, uh, uh, Google coming in with their open uh, you know, uh, automo automotive alliance, right? And, 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 and could it be that suddenly when we start having these experiences in the car and ultimately the car becomes a lot cleaner because it becomes a, you know, maybe a self-driving car at some point and ultimately the most important thing we do in that car is not drive it, but experience it. So my, my, my songs, the movies, the fact that the screen doesn't look at the road anymore, it, 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 it shows me the movie that I can watch when I drive from Toronto down to Fort Lauderdale with the kids, right? So that software becomes more important than the wheels I'm on. So these guys down here potentially become commodities because if I can plug and play everything about my car lifestyle from one car to the other, do I really care if I'm moving from you know, a Nissan to a Ford? Do they become disintermediated from the customer because these guys got the humanness in the relationship. These guys built the network. And if, I, if, if that happens, then, then services come to your car that the car manufacturers can't participate in. So Volvo has this cute little pilot where you can deliver your groceries with a keyless entry, in other words, provisioning a, a key um, you know, through the cloud, through an API to, to um, you know, Amazon or D D DHL, so that you can take deliveries into your car in a secure way, well suddenly, the evolution of lockers, when there's a huge business there, you know, virtual lockers here and, and, and drop of my groceries there, suddenly your car becomes a delivery agent for you. You're at work, you order some groceries, they get delivered to the car, it goes into the back, I drive home, everything's good. The business that, that, that can, can, can radiate from a, a car or a home or an office that is reimagined 
is profound. And the relationship that we have with this car and the monetization that we can extract from this car will not be the physical wheels or the bricks and mortar of a store. It's going to be in the software and the relationship that we have with the people inside that store. And if we lose that insight, as they did with groceries with Instacart, they lose the financial opportunity that this vehicle has on the road. And, and so, you know, you have Samsung buys a company called SmartThings. Oh my gosh, I gotta get it into the IoT race. At uh, CES, they kludge some stuff together. All these little smart widgets. Can Samsung go into a community in North America and say, you know what? We make appliances. We make phones. We make really good security, right? Can I turn this from a generic community to a Samsung community? Can I be the Google takeover here so that when I go out to buy a home, I may want a home in Thornhill or downtown Toronto, but I kind of want to have the home in a Samsung smart community or Samsung safe community. And that is the power game that's going on right now, is that IoT hasn't really started. But when it happens, this battle will be already won. And you see in, in, in Korea, cities of the future, Songdong sitting on top of phone. It's not about this, it's about this. Who wins the digital battle? Wins the relationship with the person who's in the city and can monetize that relationship going forward. So when one of the CEOs of Samsung sits in a keynote at CES and talks about open, an open system, we want an open system. Just remember this, open is a four letter word, right? So the person who controls that relationship, the person who owns the system is the person who's gonna monetize that system going forward. So let's go back to our math. So we have a thing plus an action, an action that has some value, right? Plus digital duct tape, a network. Plus the crucial thing here, which is the data behind that network. And if you get all of those things, plus you have the Ben Stiller bear hug, and you have the love, and you have the insight and the humanity behind that, and you add a little of that, then you can move forward in the future, embrace your business, embrace the vertical, whether you be in the entertainment vertical, whether you be in the retail vertical, or whether you be in the banking, financial vertical. It's all about going out into the street and giving your customer a hug that's extensible and allows you to do that in a digital way going forward. Thank you.